Individuals action. We are living, I mentioned at the outset, the age of regular risk. We are living in a time when an individual's action, whether it's an employee on the factory floor, whether it's an executive in the C-suite, whether it's a protester sitting outside of your offices, has more power than at any point ever. That sounds like Donald Trump. How about a spokesperson? I don't have to know what Jared was up to and the illegal behavior that he was conducting to know that having one person as the face of my company is a major vulnerability. If I'm advising uh, the good folks behind Flo, I might suggest that I have a plan when she drives off the road and runs over some wildlife. How about your executives? Your executives who you know perhaps have a tendency to say things a little bit too honestly, perhaps a little bit too colorfully. I don't have to know that Travis is going to be in an uber black captured on film to have identified ahead of time this is a vulnerability. It doesn't even have to be something they said. It could be something they were allegedly saying. And oh, by the way, you're never off the clock. And then we get to the area of external risks, which seem to be multiplying by the day. The political, social, economic security upheaval around the world. Movements that are penetrating organizations, ideologies. How about the penetration of cyber risks and security? And then the challenges. GDRP or GDPR is the next topic. Privacy, consumer expectations changing. And then we confront traditional crisis management, probably familiar to many of you. Batten down the hatches, let's weather the storm. The problem with that approach is that the speed, the scale, the sophistication of today's risks far outpaces that. On top of it, disruptive change is taking place amidst those crises. If your clients are not able to get out and engage, they are missing opportunities. They are not going to survive that crisis for long. And then we get to you. What are some of those risks that you're worried about? Perhaps something about malpractice or just issues of uh, your uh, workplace, or maybe just issues with your clients. How are you tracking them? Many people say, oh, yeah, 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 but I've got social listening. I've got you know, media monitoring. By the time your firm, your client is mentioned on social media, it's too late. What's your early warning system? This is about applying that national security mindset for dealing with the challenges. It could range for something as simple as trying to develop indicators that monitor workplace issues to something much more sophisticated. So this is my oversimplified version of the timeline of crises. And one of the benefits of sitting at the White House, working with folks from our intelligence agencies, is you get these insights into how crises emerge, what their trajectory is. And this is my unclassified version of what that looks like. There's an initial stage where problems are starting to percolate. This is the point at which many times you're advising your clients, wait and see. Or maybe your client is telling you, we'll wait and see. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, take away that you need to move up the timeline of crisis response. That initial stage is the point at which you have, your client has, the maximum amount of freedom of movement. Instead of sitting back or even just engaging in small and um, insignificant ways, you need to move your crisis engagement 
up and fully engaged in that early stage, even as it, it starts to worsen? How do you get out there and engage with the issue rather than pulling back? I so often use in my classes on crisis management at Georgetown the images that companies uh, are portrayed uh, as in the media during crisis. It's the exterior of your building. It's a black and white statement. How do you tell a more personal story? Crises are experienced emotionally. 